This is episode number 111, featuring artist Joseph Zabukvich. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine, and I am thrilled today is going to be a really awesome interview. Uh, I met Joseph Zabukvich at the Plein Air Convention last year. He showed up. He just wanted to kind of see what was going on and hang out. Maybe it was two years ago. Anyway, I asked him to come. I've been trying to get him to come for about, um, I think, about seven years now. And um, he came in with Thomas Schaller, who was on the faculty, and uh, he saw everything that was going on. He says, yeah, I'm in. And so we booked it for this coming year. So Joe is probably the world's best watercolor artist. Uh, and there's so many great watercolor artists, but he's kind of the king of the pack, and so this is going to be a great interview with him today. You don't want to miss it. The podcast is brought to you by American Watercolor with Kelly Kane. We hired Kelly to be the editor of Plein Air Magazine. She's doing a great job. She came from Watercolor Magazine, but we asked her to help create this new watercolor publication as well. And it's a weekly online publication. It comes by email, and you can get yours at AmericanWatercolor.net. You put your name in, you can subscribe. It's free. Go to AmericanWatercolor.net. The interview is underwritten by the watercolor track at the Plein Air Convention this April in San Francisco. We always have all the mediums, but uh, we have a special track for watercolor, oil, uh, another for pastel. We have another stage for demos. We do some acrylic. Of course, this stage uh, is all watercolor demos. The faculty includes uh, Kiko Tanabe, Michael Holter, Brian Brown, Dan Marshall, artist and author Brenda Swenson, and, of course, Joe Zabukvich, and he will be on the main stage. He's also doing a full-day pre-convention workshop and a rare U.S. appearance. He does so few appearances in the U.S., and he told me that he does um, fewer and fewer and fewer now. So this is a rare opportunity to, to actually go to a workshop with him, and he's going to teach you all his principles. That's a pre-convention workshop. It's a little extra money, but it's going to be well worth it. It's a full day. You can learn more at Plen Air convention.com, which has taken place in San Francisco, plenairconvention.com. Come on up after the interview. I'll answer some marketing questions in the marketing minute. But let's first get right to our interview with the amazing watercolor artist, Joseph Zabukvich. Well, we're, we're honored to have Joseph Zabukvich on the Plein Air podcast. Welcome, Joseph. Oh, well, welcome, Eric. <laughs> I probably botched your name. I apologize. No, a lot of people do. It is a difficult one. I think it's that letter Z at the beginning, which has now become semi-famous. I, I've shortened my letter to Mr. Z. So <laughs> I think it's a lot easier to say for most people. <laughs> well, uh, uh, for those who probably don't know yet, uh, Joe is in, uh, Austra in Australia. Are you in Melbourne? Yes, I am in Melbourne uh, at the moment. I just got back from China recently. Oh, I, I know you travel a lot. Um, well, yes. Um, so how many workshops are you doing a year? Look, I think that is one misconception I can clear up here. I actually do very, very few. It's just, I guess, that people follow me intensely, so they think I do a lot of them. But frankly, I do about six workshops a year, that's all, oh, uh, six weeks. Um, but a lot of my travel is private. I just simply go and paint, you know, plein air, or I'm a guest at conventions as I shall be at yours uh, next year. Right. So I think a lot of people see me travel and they think I'm doing a lot of workshops and I'm not. 
that's why there's such long waiting lists and people are desperate to get into them. <laughs> it's not that easy because there's really, when you divide that around the world, there's not many, is it? No, it's not. And that, I think that's why you know we're so honored to have you coming to the Plein Air Convention. Not only are you going to be teaching on stage for the entire group, but you also are doing a pre-convention workshop and because you do so few workshops and so few in America, this is a really great opportunity for people to to uh, watch you paint and study under you. Well, thank you so much for that. I am looking forward to it. Um, I, as yet, I'm not really quite sure what form that will all take. It's a little bit unusual teaching in front of so many people. So I guess it's an informed demonstration and talking. I, I assume that's the, the format it's going to take. Yeah, essentially what we uh, we typically do, because there are uh, larger than normal crowds for a workshop, it's it's typically not so much hands-on like there might be with, you know, five or six or 10 or 15 people, but it's more yeah. about, you know, your principles, uh, your tricks and techniques and you know, doing some demos and things of that nature. So I think it, it will be very exciting for people to see. And uh, I, I think it's taken us many, many years to get you to come, so we're honored that you're finally <laughs> coming. Uh, well, that's really nice of you to say. I, look, I only go to the States about every two years. I don't even go every year. And I stay for just a short time, maybe uh, three weeks or so, and I'm gone. So uh, I apologize that it's been so hard to get to me, but I, I have this problem all the time because I place painting first and I really respond very little to all these invitations and travel and stuff because I see it, it just interferes with what I do and what I love doing. And I've worked out a long time ago that painting comes first and uh, after that everything else happens if you neglect that, you very quickly uh, um, develop a, a very shallow reputation. And I've seen evidence of this uh, without naming names, of course. Uh, it is a silly thing to do is to, to let uh, other things interfere with your work. Uh, I think painting has to come number one. Anyway, that's what I believe. Well, I, I think that's a good, good thing to focus on for a second because I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think that... You know, I, I get a lot of questions about this. And, and of course, I teach marketing to artists and how they could develop their careers. And mm -hmm. there are so many things that are seductive <clears throat> that are taking painters away from painting. Um, you know, for instance, um, teaching is seductive. These plein air mm -hmm. events are seductive. Um, you know, speaking engagements, judging. And, um, yep, you know, yep. I know so many artists who have been taken away uh, 8, 10, 15, 20 weeks a year, and then they're not getting good, long, consistent periods of time behind the easel. Totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. Um, it's, I have once or twice fallen on the sword and let events take me over and worried about all sorts of nonsense and sales and imagery and all sorts of things. Only to find myself, you know, bereft of any work and uh, having to repeat paintings to quickly fill up exhibitions and things, which is a, a bad, bad move. So it's been years ago that I decided that that's it. I wake up and I paint and I don't uh, let anything else get in front of me. Well, so as soon as this interview is over, that's what I'll be doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're so you're not painting while you're talking. That's good. <laughs> no, well, I, I think I better pay some attention to what I'm doing here. <laughs> that's okay. Well, I I think what I'd like to do is to back up all the way to the beginning and understand how you got from the very beginning in in your start to what I think most people consider as the the world's best watercolor artist, and so. Um, Goodness me. Can, can you kind all of articulate right. uh, how this all began for you? I'm not sure how far back you want to go because, of course, art has always been with me as a small child. So, I mean, we could go as far back as that, but maybe I'll just keep that very brief. Of course, I grew up uh, in former Yugoslavia, which was a communist country, and that was the reason we left in 1970. But... You know, life is formed of small incidents. It's 
not really, you know, people think you make these major decisions and do all sorts of stuff, but you, you don't really know. It's uh, like that movie, Sliding Doors. You make some little decision or see something and your life has changed forever. I think we all know this. So when I was a child, I wasn't really exposed to art. We grew up on a tiny little farm, you know, uh, where everyone had to do their job and so on, and uh, myself included. But one evening, uh, the, all the relatives were sitting around in winter, of course. There was no TV then or anything like that. People entertained themselves around the radio or sat around the kitchen table talking. And from somewhere, my dad provided some pay ledgers that, were, that had blank pages on the back of them from work and they were all sitting around and drawing and I snuck in and did a drawing of my uncle across the table and pandemonium broke loose because they all said it looked exactly like him. I wish I had the drawing. I was only about five or four or five. And of course then I had to draw everybody and I became an entity in that family. Before that I was just one of the kids hanging around, you know, like all the kids. But then I became special you know anyone who came to the house they sat them down and said this kid is going to draw you <laughs> and I did drawings of them so my fame became very early I was five but you know honestly that was on a family level of course but it did wake me up and I realized that I had something it made me different it, it made it gave me my identity it, I became I guess uh, someone who had something special Years went by, of course, and this was all recognised in high school and so on. And I did the usual stuff, but I kept painting, you know, even as a teenager, because the kids were buying cigarettes or wasting money on whatever, where well, I was buying paints and brushes wherever I could get them and gathering up anything flat that I could paint on. But in those days, I painted poster paints, uh, gouache, not watercolour. Watercolour was discovered later. Then we emigrated to Australia and my father, to entice me to go, I didn't want to go, I was 18, said you could do art at university instead of doing languages, which is what I was doing, which came in incredibly handy because I could speak English clearly when I arrived. So I went to uni and discovered watercolour and then the rest is history, really. Uh, my career took off very quickly. Um, by the time I was 26, I gave up full-time work and had first solos and um, have never looked back. And it's just been getting better every year. If you look at my career, I guess, you know, uh, my painting, of course, has also improved immensely. And if I can say, this is a handy subject for you, that it was actually the plain -E thing that did it. Before, uh, let's say I was probably, I did do some plein air work by myself, but I kind of didn't take it very seriously. I just went out to do some more drawing, coloured in with a bit of watercolour. I uh, was taken away on a painting trip with a group of painters, probably early 80s. And I failed miserably because I was so used to doing studio work. I, I came back with one little painting after a week and much frustration. But it set me on a course and I uh, decided to conquer this. And I went out almost daily. And nowadays, a lot of people don't even know this, about 85%, 90% of my work is plein air work. Anything you see on the internet, anything you see, and exhibitions, anything you see anywhere, it's, it was done on location. I do only some larger works in the studio and work up the plein air pieces, you know, add some bits and pieces. I call it French polishing. So, of course, and then I was discovered in China recently. Um, that's been the biggest change in the last few years. Well, tell me about that. What, what, what has that change meant to you? Well, it's meant incredible financial success, but more than that, it, it's also um, rewarded all the years of work in China. They look at all the people 
totally differently to the West. We are obsessed with youth here. There, the older you get, the more respect you get. And for instance, if there's a group of artists exhibiting, the oldest person gets the top billing, and irrespective of their fame or ability. It is just simply how that culture works. And it's also given me um, newfound confidence, I guess, uh, where I was, especially in Australia, the art, art scene is kind of dying off a bit. It's uh, the traditional art is, oof, the galleries are closing left, right and centre. Anyhow, I... Uh, over there, I can. I'm totally revered. I'm literally mobbed by by huge groups of young kids. Believe it or not, not even um, the usual, you know, senior citizens that we seem to get at <laughs> workshops and things. People who have retired and decided to rekindle their love of art. Over there, there's 20 year old kids, hundreds of them. They actually have universities. I lecture there that have degrees in watercolour, believe it or not, and they have developed a new policy, I guess, or whatever. They are inviting the Western artists to come over and give them um, lectures and um, demonstrations and workshops, and they're embracing it with open arms. They want to learn. Yeah, I was uh, just I, I was just uh, made aware of an opportunity to go to China uh, for three weeks, all expenses paid by the government. Yep. Um, yep. And uh, that's the, the second time that's happened. Uh, I've had to turn it down because of family obligations and so on. But they're they're very yep. serious yep. about that. So there's something about the culture there that's different in in terms of their appreciation and love of art. Is it because they're teaching it throughout school, and and it's been dropped. I I don't know about Australia, but in America, it's been dropped from the schools, and is yeah. extracurricular at best. Yes, look, uh, you speak the truth. It's identical in Australia. It's, it's become just a, a bit of entertainment, especially watercolor. It's it's considered a, an old lady sketching medium, and that's it. It's not seriously taken in national galleries and things. They won't even hang the water. Colors. They're somewhere in the storeroom, and even the famous ones from last century. Look, they have a different attitude to us completely, and it's the very reason they are where they are today. The China is becoming, you know, this, it's a sleeping dragon that's woken up. They do things. They decide to do something, they do it. And they have the, the know-how and they have the money and the, the finances to get on with it. They don't kid around. You could not find a government department anywhere in the States or there are say in Australia or anywhere that would pay, let's say, 20 top artists from China to come over for three weeks, pay their fares, pay their hotels, pay their food and give them spending money and buy all their paintings. Where would you find a person who would back that sort of project in the West? You just wouldn't unless it was an eccentric millionaire who decided to do some silly thing like that. Over there, it's a common occurrence. They invest in their future. Uh, it is quite remarkable. They, they don't mind spending money where they think it will benefit future generations. So they're showing these kids how to do art in a Western way. There are two schools of painting there, uh, watercolour. There's the old, you know, the... the, the uh, the roles that they do, uh, which are very traditional. And now they're trying to embrace the Western style, but they're actually not all that knowledgeable in that. So they're bringing in Western people to show them um, how to go about it. So, but it's their attitude. They just simply do things. They don't, they don't muck around, as we call it here. Well, I would, I, uh, first off, I think that's very promising. It's not only promising for China, but it probably is promising for artists in the West who... Uh, could see their works embraced and sold in China. Yes, there's that point. But the other point is that I truly believe that in a generation or so, I'm sad to admit this, uh, that every top watercolorist in the world, the Chinese, I mean, some of these kids do work that is mind-blowing and they're only in their 20s. 
I mean, I was scratching away at simple little paintings when I was at that age. They do portraits that, that, that you cannot believe how how beautifully they're done. And these are clean, beautiful, proper, fresh watercolours. There's no overworking. There's, they understand the medium. Well, they invented it 2,000 years ago. So uh, it's not surprising. It's in their blood. Plus their calligraphy, you know, the, the way they do their writing, lends itself beautifully to painting Um Western writing is very stiff. You know, you repeat the same letters over and over and it leads to this tight sort of style of painting where they can hold a brush like a maestro at, at the age of five. You know what I mean? Because their writing is so fluid and so beautiful, uh, the calligraphy that they do. So they, they've got a, a huge advantage on so many levels. So what but you... I think it's a good thing for watercolour worldwide. It, it, it'll help both ways. It'll help both ways. I would assume they're doing the same thing in, in other forms of painting, oil, oil, acrylic, et cetera. Um, not so much. No, really? No, just watercolour. Really? No, just watercolour. I'm not quite sure what the reason for that is. They don't revere oil painting to uh, as big a degree and they're happy to keep that in-house. They have some very good oil painters and they have huge exhibitions and they do very well. But I don't think that they invite oil painters over um, at all. It is really just a watercolour. I'm not quite certain why that is. Hmm. Um, maybe it's just simply in their blood and they want to do it. I'm, I'm not quite certain what the reason is. But there's festivals of watercolour there. Well, obviously, you have a couple of invitations. They're everywhere. I get emails constantly. They keep doing them. And the government sponsors. They're not just, you know, some little tin pot operation. These are properly organised. Um, they have beautiful opening ceremonies and top galleries. And it's all curated beautifully. It is not an amateurish occurrence of any any sort. So th that begs the question about what those of us in America and Australia should be doing uh, to increase the value uh, proposition for art uh, overall for the future. Because we're, you know, we're not educating people. Um, there, there is not a high, high value placed on it with, with a lot of people, especially younger people who probably haven't been exposed to it like a lot of us were. Yep. Yep, yep, that's the problem, the education system. Art is just, you know, it's the first thing that's cut off the curriculum to save money. Um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a communist country. We actually had to draw plaster casts and I had classical training, which I'm sure is um, the backbone of, of my work nowadays. I had to learn perspective, I had to learn drawing, I had to do tone, I had to look. The, all, of, all of the tools that you need if you're going to be an artist. Now, the system now doesn't allow for this. I mean, the art schools today produce people. Oh, I went to an exhibition recently. A kid is scratching uh, sheets of perspex and shining LED lights through it so you can see the scratches. And this is called art. And we all know thousands of examples like that, of all sorts of nonsense that's now called art. Uh, the, the, the traditional form is gone. The only place you can still learn that is in uh, either China or in Russia. In St. Petersburg, there's an academy. It still teaches traditional form. We just don't have the formal training um, today or interest in it. You know, there's just, just no interest in it. Uh, I paint down the street and a few young kids stop and are really amazed at what I'm doing. And I have a strong following, believe it or not, online with the digital artists who do backgrounds to cartoons and, you know, digital art. Of course. They want to learn. And I've had a few of them in my uh, classes and they're in their twenties. They want to learn all the rules of how to create depth and distance and that sort of thing. Well, I think but you're going to find them, you're going to find a lot of them at the plein air convention because, of course, Northern yes. California and Southern California has a load of yes. animators, and yes. uh, we have a number of animators from uh, Pixar, Disney, etc., who are 
uh, uh, signed up for the nice. convention will be coming. So you, you may be the reason they're coming. Look, uh, don't be surprised. Uh, it's, there's an underwork, uh, sort of underground network of, of these kids. They all keep in touch with each other. And I've, I've got a feeling I'm a bit of a pop star amongst them. <laughs> they, they really uh, like my work. Uh, I've met quite feel, a few of them. Must feel good, huh? Well, yes. Look, it's, a, it's good to be able to reach uh, to the younger generation, even if it's just in that field. Of course, they don't paint. They just produce these um, amazing digital things. One kid showed me how to use uh, some of these tools that they use. And honestly, I did a charcoal drawing and we printed it off. And unless you used a magnifying glass, it was real. It was a charcoal drawing, you know. Uh, but all I was doing was using my fingers and a stick to, to on a computer screen. Yes. It's just remarkable. So that's one future. But uh, as far as poor old watercolour goes, you know, and traditional art goes, I think we are in the West in particular in serious trouble with, with all that. And I guess um, your convention uh, is trying to solve that problem a little, but it reaches out to not wrong people, but different people, different crowd. Young kids, you know, they're on the mobile phone, or you call them cell phones, I think. Um, they are busy making money. My studio is next door to a very trendy cafe, you know, the, the hipster heaven. The, the, you can get a thing that's called deconstructed coffee. And that is you get a hot and cold glass of water and a, and a concentrated shot of coffee and you can make your own coffee. This will cost you $8. <laughs> but these kids walk past my window and I have always a painting in the window or I'm in there working. They don't even see it. They, they just walk past. They, they, their world is so different but that sort of activity, someone creating something by hand, is just not in their world. Well, you know, I, I, don't, um, I uh, certainly don't want to me, me to disagree, but I, I am seeing some glimmer of hope. Uh, first off, um, I, I don't know about where you are, but I'm seeing a lot of the, the, uh, the younger people who are now moving uh, towards analog. They're not moving away from digital, but, you know, for instance, it started with, with uh, vinyl, with albums. Um, because yes. and and now even some are moving to typewriters just for the experiences of of analog and, and photography and, as well. And, that's right. They're going back to film. Yeah, that's right. And, and my own kids are doing film photography now. And so I think that uh, there is there's a chance that some of this might translate to art. You know, a lot of these digital animators are now going out plein air painting. Um, and, and it started out because they wanted to learn more about light and color and shape and form because you could see that much more clearly outdoors than you could from photo references. And, and now they're becoming addicted to it. They're loving the, the yep. idea yep. and the experience, not only yep. Of, yep. of painting for themselves, but painting with other people. So maybe there's a little bit of hope, a little glimmer of hope anyway. Uh, look, I totally agree with you. There is a subculture. Um, there's kids now making things out of wood. There's a little shop just up the road from me, and the guy's collecting, you know, recycling timber, and he's making chairs and bits and pieces from that and sanding in there by hand. And he looks like he's only in his 20s. I haven't met him yet. There is all that, and I see kids with real cameras, you know, and I asked one why he was doing it, and he said it was real. He said that the, the digital camera, if there's no electricity, it's, it, there's nothing there. This is actually real. The moment you press that shutter, that photo is there forever, unless it's burnt or destroyed. So that's, that's interesting that they are coming back to it, and it is pleasing, and I'm really hoping... That that it will revive itself somehow, and that's how things start. They always start from grassroots, don't they? They're not imposed by anybody. That's right, and and they all they also start from younger generations who want something different from maybe what their parents they have had. To. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. Joseph, I, I'm curious about. Let's talk about painting specifically in terms of process. Um, yeah. If if you had to start from scratch today, knowing what you know, uh, mm -hmm. knowing the track that you went through, it sounds like you were born with some natural talent, which doesn't happen very often, but you've taught enough students over time. What is the 
the best way for someone to learn the full process of painting uh, from start to finish? Uh, well, of course, today there's so much more available than there was when I started. Um, uh, there was not even the DVDs or, or, well, they used to have those tapes in those days, videos. Um, but there was not even those. There was a few books, and they were not very good. And there was a few teachers, but there was mainly people trying to make a few dollars on a side. It really was not a, a, a great place to learn to, to begin. So I'm totally self-taught. I've never been to a teacher. I just simply went out and did it. Now, when you said it yourself, I was lucky. I had natural talent, which I just evolved by myself, and I came up with my own technique for what it's worth, just by trial and error. Today, you do have an amazing array of help if you need it. You can learn online, you can download things, you can have DVDs, you can have teachers everywhere, travel the world following you know, famous uh, teachers. You can do whatever you like. However, I'll say a word of warning that that in itself can be a trap I personally actually avoid looking at too much art and too, too much work from other people. I find that it pollutes my brain and I can't help myself. I end up repeating something that I saw that Alvaro did or, or whoever. So in a way, that's not a good thing, but in a way, it is, it's like everything else in life. You know, it, it cuts both ways. It's very helpful. But you can overdo it. And uh, there are people who go from workshop to workshop to workshop and really never develop their own style and never really paint by themselves. Well, that can I've become very few. confusing because you're, it is. You know, you're, it you're is. getting contradictory information from five different people. Constantly, yes. It, it is not a good way to go. Just as it's not a good way to go to follow a particular person and become obsessed with them. I mean, I have probably more copiers in the world than any other artist. I know I keep seeing the famous cars with a white windshield everywhere. I mean, following a particular person also robs you of your original idea. So what I'll say is this, that you really need to believe in yourself a bit and Get some basic knowledge first, you know, just how to do washes and how to mix colors or whatever and learn about time and value and a few, a few technical aspects like that. But I think as soon as you've got a reasonable facility with, with those elements, you really should strike out on your own. And the few talented people that I have met in my classes, I have given them that advice. I've stopped them coming to my workshops too much and I've said to them, just go out there and paint, just paint. Don't don't think, don't try to overanalyze it, don't make a big story out of it. Just simply put that easel up and paint and it will come, it'll find you. And this is the thing that I always say to people, you don't decide to become an artist, it chooses you. And if you're going to be an artist, you're going to be an artist. No amount of teaching, no amount of saying, I will be an artist and buying expensive equipment and going to workshops and things is going to make you an artist. You can't make that decision for yourself. It, it really comes from somewhere else. I'm not sure where that is. And I was the fortunate one to be chosen. As I said, at the age of five, it was already there. So I... Uh, for to, to summarize at the end, I will just say to all those people who, who do painting and are kind of striking out and, and wanting to find a shortcut, there isn't one. There's just lots of hard work. And if they were to go to Academy in Moscow and St. Petersburg or in China, they'd find that they'd spend four years just drawing and maybe helping the master to mix some paint. You know, they wouldn't be allowed to touch paint for, for a couple of years. So it's a completely different road. And uh, it was Robert Wade who said that painting was a 25-year apprenticeship. And I, I truly believe that. I don't think it was certainly 20 years or so 
where I could say, yes, I started to produce something worthwhile. Before that, I painted nice pictures and sold them and did very nicely. But really, I started to get into the nitty-gritty of it after many, many years of, of painting. Today, everyone wants everything. Press a button, and it's done. You know, it, it, uh, unfortunately, people are just not prepared to put in years and years of hard, hard work like they used to. I sound old, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well. one of the things, as I was preparing for this and looking through uh, a a number of paintings that you've done recently, uh, one of the things that I noticed is that you you manage in every painting to create a mood. Is that is that something that is intentional? Uh, Is it something that just happens? No, it's definitely there. I don't paint objects themselves. Painting pictures is not for me. I mean, there are people who do photorealism and things like that, but even that can be taken. Like you've got Angus McEwen, for instance, he does super realistic paintings, but they have something to them, some some kind of a extra dimension, which cannot be defined. And that's the thing. People call it mood or atmosphere or whatever. I couldn't tell you even how I achieved that it's kind of a subconscious effort almost. And I find that if it's not in my painting, that painting will never make it to the uh, uh, gallery wall. Uh, you know, it'll be discarded. Uh, it is what I seek. I, I don't paint the objects. I paint the feel of the place, whether it's a hot summer day or misty morning or whatever it may be. And to achieve that, there is no formula. You just simply have to feel the, the place and get that somehow across by using very traditional tools, you know, tones, edges, all the usual things. That technique itself is the same as Rembrandt used or, or Sargent or whoever, you know, or every painter that's ever lived from Egyptian times. But to get that something else, that, that feeling, Oof, I, I wish you could somehow, I don't think you're meant to uh, have a formula for that. I don't think it's doable. And some people try it, you know, they have cute kids on the beach with a bucket making sand castles, and then you end up with corny paintings, if you know what I mean. Yeah. That kitsch type of look, where it is mood, but it's, you know, it, it is kitsch. And then you've got Norman Rockwell who did it, but somehow with him it was art. So there's always someone who can push that edge and make it work. It's an interesting thing. Now, when when you uh, when you show up to a place to paint, <clears throat> do you have mm. do do you just sit and study? Do you just jump right in? Do you do you have a planning process? What what's going through your head? Yes, look, uh, I do take my time. I've learned over the years that jumping straight into it is not a good move. You you can end up not thinking it through. And the number one thing I look for is composition, of course. But I also wait for, I don't know what you would call it. It's a vision, an inner eye vision. I can see the finished painting on my paper. And until I see that, I don't start. I find that if I start before that, I'm just blindly going on. I have no idea where I'm heading. But if I can sort of see more or less where this painting is going to go, what sort of look, what sort of colouring, where the where the strength is going to be, where the edges are going to be, I sit there and study it for a while. But this is me. You know, I've just had a week away with a, a few buddies painting and Alvaro is amongst them and Herman Pico and some other guys you wouldn't know. And Alvaro is the opposite. He just gets there and into it. And he just has this huge energy. But he has a failure rate, you know, they, you know, because they don't sometimes work because he goes into it a bit too quickly. But when they work, they're amazing. So that's his technique. He just battles into it. And, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So for him, that works. Uh, Herman Pickle, 
he always spends a little bit of time as well and has a good look and really is a master of composition. He will get a painting out of almost nothing. Um, so I find that when I get to a spot, I won't stop unless it's a good composition. And secondly, I won't start painting until I see what I'm going to paint on my paper. It doesn't always come out as I saw it, but it gives me that lead. I then go towards it. I, I aim towards it, and but I listen to the watercolour as I paint and change my mind and go with it. I dance with it. You know, I let it change my mind. If, if I do a wash and there's something happening at the bottom of it that I wasn't planning, but it looks terrific, I'll, I'll keep it. I'll go with it. You know, I'll let it demand what I should be doing. I always say, until I start painting, I'm the boss. Once I start painting, watercolour is the boss. It decides where I go. It tells me. And if you don't listen to that, you don't end up with a good painting. Uh, and if there's a failing amongst students that I see all the time, is that inability to see what the watercolour is telling them. Like there, there may be a beautiful edge happening on a wash or something that you could really make terrific use of. But they don't see it, so, so they paint over it, or they don't simply just even see it, they don't even notice it. So this kind of a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your painting, this dance, this 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 two-step, if you don't develop that, you'll never be an artist. That's as simple as that. I don't mean to be cruel about it, but that, that's how it works. Uh, it, you really need to understand that medium and you need to understand its possibilities, where it can take you, and then you just follow that. And when you master that after about 20, 30 years, then it's easy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's actually quite easy to paint. You know, I, I don't find it very difficult nowadays. It used to be really difficult. Uh, because I did struggle with, with things because I kept aiming for what I wanted to do. I didn't listen to the watercolour. I didn't listen to my painting. I just thought, no, I want this. And watercolour was saying, no, oh, look, stupid. Here is a beautiful passage here. Why don't you do something with it? But I would obliterate it because it wasn't in my plan. So I don't do too much uh, planning. I actually just simply respond to the subject and to the painting and we kind of work on it together till the last stroke and of course stopping when you should stop is another how do you know trick. how do you know uh, yes as uh, i don't know if you whistler was a very pompous man and a lady asked him once sir can you tell me how do you know when your painting is finished? And he answered in his pompous way, when I say so, madam. <laughs> well, I think it's a little bit like that without being pompous. You just got to cut it. You know, it is so easy to just say, oh, no, I'll just do a bit, a bit more, a bit more. And I still do it. Don't worry. I know. Important I, for me I, to pass I, that I'm on to you. Foolproof. Um, I did nine works in three days on this trip. And two of them are overcooked. I just simply kept going towards the end where I should have stopped and let it sit where it was. So they're the only ones that failed. The other ones are good because I just said, okay, uh, any other addition uh, would spoil the, the message. You know, so that would be it. It spoils the feel of it. One stroke extra and it's all over. Yeah, it's no. But how do you know this? I don't know. I can't tell you. Yeah. You know, you just simply have got to, uh, sure. again, really look at the painting and understand it. Well, it's just gut, you know. And, and I think sometimes you just have to turn it off. It's like writing a book, you know. It's a book that yeah. would never be done if you don't just stop at some point. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. You can just keep going forever and ever. And. With watercolor, you can't. I mean, that's the difficulty of it, but it's also the beauty of it. You know, um, I've done some oil painting, and apart from it being so boringly slow to paint, 
you can do miracles with it, but it's very slow. Um, you know, it takes you half an hour to paint a sky watercolor. You can do it in two seconds. So apart from that, it is a medium where you really physically have got to decide when to stop. The painting is sort of telling you, but not as much as it is watercolor. If you listen to it, if you watch what you're doing, and if you leave it alone, watercolor will simply say, that's it. You can't do any more, because if you do any more, the message will become muddier, not as clear, not as fresh, not as nice. So, there was so it's a, just a matter of paying attention. There was a time um, not so long ago when watercolor paintings were not necessarily desired heavily by the gallery scene. And it mm. seems, seems to be changing. Uh, why do you think it was and why do you think it's changing? Well, and that question has always been around, and I, I think it's purely historic. I mean, if you go to museums in Europe or castles and things, they're filled with oil paintings. Because simply uh, in the old days, we're talking a few centuries ago, uh, people who had the money and wanted to decorate uh, the castles or villas and things, well, they got oil painters because that's all there was around and the bits of paper that you could do watercolors on was tiny where you could do giant oils. So it's purely historic. And then, it, of course, people were exposed to it over the centuries, visiting these museums and galleries and looking at oil paintings. So the psyche of Western thinking was... Um, Proper oil painting, uh, proper painting is oil painting. Uh, I must tell you a funny story. I came to pick up uh, my painting from a mixed exhibition, and the young man handing paintings out after the show had finished asked me, "Are you picking up uh, a painting or watercolor?" Oh no! Um, so I looked at him and I said, "What do you mean by that?" And he said, "Well, are you picking up a painting or a watercolor?" And he was serious. I said to him, look, you're really playing with fire here. I mean, I'm not a violent man, but if you said that to some other watercolorist, they would not be pleased. No, but I could not convince him. He said, there's proper painting, oil painting, and then there's watercolor. And he he could not equate one to the other. So that's the ultimate victim of, of where we're at. As far as population goes, now we can get big sheets of paper. We have got some great uh, watercolour painters. So I think that sort of thinking is slowly turning around a bit. Well, you also don't, um, have, you also don't have the fleeting colours. Like, uh, I, I think originally the watercolours exactly. would fade and they don't do that anymore. Exactly, exactly. So there's a lot of innovations that have now happened which are helping watercolour out. And look, fashions are fashions. Um, they go in circles. I have been in the game now 40 years and I've watched watercolour go up and down. It goes in about five year cycles. It takes a year or so for it to become popular. Then it's popular for a year or so and then it takes another year or so to go down again and so forth. So every five years it reaches a bit of a pinnacle and then it goes down sometimes a bit longer. At the moment it seems to be picking up again. Uh, It was down like two or three years ago. It was definitely down. So it's it's just people's uh, fashions and things and decorating. And then you've got, of course, the problems of uh, reflecting glass and so on. People don't like it. If they're decorating, they can't see the painting and so on and so forth. Well, there's a, there's a huge, there historical. seems to be a huge interest in, in plein air watercolor painting now. It, when, when we first started the plein air convention, we, we didn't have any watercolor sessions to speak of. We may have had one or two. Now we have enough right. people coming that we have a, a – we not only have you on the main stage, but we have – a whole room devoted to plein air watercolor painting and, and, a, and a lot of it's a faculty in, in and of to itself. So we're seeing a, yes. a huge resurgence in popularity from that standpoint. So it used to, used to be from my perspective that most of the watercolor painters were sticking to the inside, but a lot of them are now mm. discovering the importance of going outside, probably thanks to people yes. like you. I guess so. I guess so. I think that's what's happened. 
Well, look, I think a lot of it is also to do with, uh, you know, internet and so on. It becomes uh, accessible. So uh, Betty from a little town in the West somewhere, she can turn on her computer and and watch me paint or whoever, and uh, it's spread the news everywhere. I think that's also uh, one of the elements that's brought it out. Well, it's been a, a real joy to have you on the Plein Air podcast today, Joseph, and, and we're very much looking forward to having you uh, both in the pre-convention workshop and also on stage, the main stage at the Plein Air convention this year in San Francisco in April. And uh, thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. Pleasure is mine, and I look so much forward to it. I have made many friends in the States now, and I hope some of them can make it there and we can uh, hang out together and have a few beers after painting, of course. <laughs> so I do look forward to it and I look forward to seeing you again. We only met once, I think, in San Diego. Yes, you came to the Plein Air Convention in San Diego. That was nice. That's right. That's right. I had a little hangout there with Daniel Marshall. So it's all good. I thank you. And we shall see you in not that long to go. It's tomorrow, I think, just about. (laughs) As far as the artists are concerned, time just flies. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Well, thank you again. Well, thank you again to Joseph Zabukvich. And I am so honored that he would be on the Plein Air podcast. What a nice man. Excited to have him come into the Plein Air convention this year. It's taken a long time to get him there. Well, how about we do some marketing? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your questions, which you can email me anytime, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Here's a question from Kevin in Nashville, Tennessee. Kevin says, Eric, I've been working on art and finally have decided to start selling it, start marketing it. Where should I advertise? Well, Kevin, asking me that question is probably not very objective because, of course, I'm going to tell you you should advertise in Plein Air Magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur, Artists on Art, American Watercolor, Plein Air Today, and Fine Art Today. Lots of good options. Uh, But quite frankly, even though they're good options and very targeted to very specific artists like Fine Art Connoisseurs, very targeted to collectors, Plein Air reaches the Plein Air collectors and the artists. But I have to tell you that most advertising dollars are wasted, right? Because many people don't understand advertising. And and one of the things that happens is when you're first learning advertising, you're going to easily get seduced by things that people tell you, which may or may not be accurate, but most importantly, not necessarily effective for you. Most people spend their time and money where they are comfortable and where their friends are. Let me give you uh, an example of that, for instance. Uh, I had this guy named Murray uh, who I tried to get to advertise with my radio stations one time. Um, He owned a clothing store in Salt Lake City that appealed to teenagers. And I owned a top 40 station that appealed to teenagers, and it was a perfect fit. Yet he wouldn't advertise with us. He advertised on the local elevator music station. And when I asked him who his customers were, he said, they're teens. I said, well, why do you advertise on the elevator music station that doesn't have any teens listening? And he said, well, it's where my friends are. It's the friends at the country club, and it gives me a lot of status at the country club. And I said, well, is it working? Is it bringing in teens? He says, no, but it's making me very popular at the country club. His goal was ego and popularity. For that, it was a good move, but it wasn't necessarily about selling product. If you really want to sell product, don't worry about where your friends are and if your friends are seeing your ads. What you want to worry about is, are you in the right fit? For instance, if you want to reach wealthy collectors, then you want to go to something like Fine Art Connoisseur, which has ultra-wealthy collectors, lots of billionaires, lots of really, really wealthy people. Uh, if you want to reach people who collect plein air paintings and people who go on the plein air circuit, then you want to go to plein air magazine. If you want to reach people who are artists and specifically you want to talk to them about something that is you're selling to artists, then you want to be in plein air magazine or artists on art, uh, et cetera. So think about that. Uh, but good advertising is about good targeting. Pick a place that matches what you're trying to accomplish. And of course, if you read my books and you watch my videos, I always am talking about how you really need to figure out what you want to accomplish and develop a strategy before you start doing a tactic. Advertising is a tactic, an important one, no less, but you have to be ready for it. 
and advertising takes some time. You gotta do it right. We can walk you through how to do that. Anyway, I have a whole section on that in my book. Another question from Michelle in St. Petersburg, Florida. I'm not sure I understand the concept of branding and why it's important. Can you explain it for me? Well, Michelle, branding is a complicated subject and I'll try to tackle it briefly. Uh, did you know that the top line of BMW car, the top line of BMW is also the exact same car as a Bentley? Same frame, same engine, same body. Uh, the style is, the body style is slightly different, but everything is about the same. The only difference is the manufacturing cost. It's $18,000 more because they put some special interior touches and they put the special Bentley grill and stuff like that on it. Yet, I'm told the difference in price is $150,000 more than the BMW. So you could buy the BMW for $150,000 less and get about the same car. Yet Bentley is the top upscale brand or one of the top, and you have to be very, very rich to drive a $250,000 car. Yet it's still a car, why not just buy a Kia for $20,000, right? Well, it's not about transportation, is it? It's about stature, it's about status, it's about self-image of the buyer wanting to be known for and seen with the best. And it's not just that, it's a creating a position. For instance, you could buy a track phone for about 100 bucks. Why bother with an iPhone that's 1,000 bucks? Well, it's because you want the cool stuff, but you want the status with it. Most of us don't think about the status, but there's kind of a little hidden thing in the back of our head that we want the best, right? Price appeals to certain groups. High price appeals to other groups. Low prices appeal to certain groups. Ultra high, ultra high prices appeal to certain groups. So the brand you reinforce helps people determine if you fit into their world. I've told many times about the lady who tore up a check when the man said, she asked the, the man, how much is this painting? He said $4,000. She wrote a check for $40,000. He said, no ma'am, you misunderstood, it's 4,000. She said, oh, it must not be very good. She ripped up the check and went away, right? So the brand you reinforce helps determine if you fit in their world. She didn't think a, a $4,000 painting fit into her world but a $40,000 painting did. We can't relate to that because we don't necessarily have that kind of money, but that's how things work. And so a brand creates what people's, it reflects people's self-esteem. You gotta figure out where you wanna be seen, you wanna stand for something, and a brand is also about developing trust in the minds of your target customers. We know people, I know people anyway, you probably do too, uh, we know people who sell their paintings for a million dollars or for a quarter of a million dollars. And we also know paintings that are the same size and maybe pretty close and equal quality that are a whole lot less money, but it's because of the brand of the artist, because the artist is well known. The artist has proven himself or herself and developed a following, and that's what branding is all about. So when you have a good brand, it really serves you because it helps you get better prices, but you have to build that brand. That doesn't happen overnight. We have a whole section on the book in that. Anyway, hope that helps. Today's podcast was sponsored by American Watercolor Magazine with Kelly Kane. It comes out weekly to your email. You can get yours at AmericanWatercolor.net. Don't forget it's .net, not .com, .net, AmericanWatercolor.net. The interview is underwritten by the watercolor track of the Plein Air Convention in San Francisco this April. It's going to be a blast. And for those of you who don't know, uh, if you're into uh, going out and painting in San Francisco, that's great. We've got some killer locations. It's going to be fun. But we also this year, because there's some folks who don't want to drive, they don't want to park, and there's some folks who want to just kind of stay indoors, we've developed a special indoor painting track as well. So we're going to actually project video uh, and have a room set up so people who don't want to leave the convention center, or not the convention center, but the hotel, can set up and paint. And you can see the movement, the clouds moving, you can hear the sounds, but it's going to be on video. So that's your option if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to go out and paint. Anyway, the convention is going to be featuring artist Joseph Zabukvich on the main stage. It's taken us years to get him. And he's also doing a full pre-convention workshop, a rare U.S. appearance. You can learn more at plenairconvention.com. Also, if you've not seen my blog where I talk about life, art, philosophy, and lots of other stuff, it's called Sunday Coffee. Guess what day it comes out? That's right. 
Anyway, you can find it and subscribe for free, coffeewitheric.com. Got a lot of people reading that. Thank you very much. This is always fun. I love doing these interviews, talking to these artists, and let's do this again sometime like next week. I'll see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. And remember, it's a big world out there. Let's go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plen Air Podcast with Plen Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plen Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.